Heavenly Father, we ask that you would illuminate your word to us and that you would illuminate to us the light of the world. Uh, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be that star, like the star that the wise men follow to King Jesus. And we do ask that you would lead us uh, to King Jesus today uh, and make him the bright spot of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, my wife and I, as you know, have the privilege of raising our little rambunctious one and three month old son. And so when he accomplishes new things like walking or talking uh, or running or obeying, that's our favorite one, we praise him. And as I look, looked into Matthew 2, 1 to 12, I couldn't help but compare uh, baby King Jesus to our son and realize how different he must have been uh, to our son as the wise men come and bow down before Jesus, a newborn king. Never have my wife and I worshipped our son. We praise him, but we don't worship him. But Jesus is this newborn king in Matthew 2 who is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of the wise men's worship as well. Uh, so when we look into the story of uh, Jesus' birth and his childhood, uh, there are two places in Scripture that show us that. Uh, Matthew and Luke give us accounts of Jesus' childhood. Mark and John skip over it. So today we're looking into uh, Matthew's account of Jesus' childhood. Uh, Matthew uh, records the wise men and Luke records the shepherds. They're actually two different accounts. So we'll be looking at these wise men characters. When you look at Matthew 2, 1 to 12, um, you'll see two things that I, I think should pop out to you. you you'll see these king-like figures as the main characters. And then you'll see worship as the main topic. Uh, and that's what Matthew chapter 2 is all about. Kings worshiping this newborn Savior, Jesus, the King. I want to suggest that when we look at Matthew chapter 2, that we look at it as a drama written and directed by God. Uh, not really fit for Christmas pageants, even though we try to duplicate the Christmas story into pageants, uh, but this is a story directed by God. And you can see that with these three different prophecies that are fulfilled. You have Micah 5.2 that you can see in verse 6, uh, where Jesus Christ's birth uh, and birth, birth place is prophesied. And then in Isaiah 60, verse 6, uh, this Old Testament verse uh, connects uh, the wise men to Jesus. It says, A multitude of camels shall come, shall cover you, uh, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. You can see that being fulfilled as these wise men come. The Numbers 24, 24 17 is also a word from God that is fulfilled, that was written years and years before this point, and it connects the star to Jesus' birth. It, um, it says this, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of, of, of Sheth. So, I give you those prophecies in order to say that only God could have directed this. This, this birth story of Jesus was a long time coming. It was perfectly planned by God. So with that being said, let me give you an outline for moving forward. Uh, in these 12 verses, we're going to have two scenes. We're going to have scene number one in verses one and eight, which takes place in Jerusalem. So imagine the curtain pulling back and you see Jerusalem with uh, wise men from the east rolling into town with dust all over their clothing, probably dark with the sun and weary, probably slumped over from a long journey. And then, and, and the topic is how these magi are seeking to worship Jesus. In verse 2, they say, we have come so that we can worship the king. Scene number 2 uh, transitions in verse 9, where we move from Jerusalem down to Bethlehem, from uh, the, the urban to the rural. And finally, we see the wise men finding worship. They're seeking to worship Jesus. They find worship himself. 
And I hope that we kind of go along this journey with the wise men today as, as we seek to worship him and we indeed find him and we do worship him. Uh, so in verse 1, it kind of gives us a behind-the-scenes uh, kind of look into this story by saying, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, so what came before this? So let me just briefly uh, catch us up on this, even though you probably know. Uh, so we know Jesus was just born in a miraculous fashion. Uh, we have God who became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, we have the miracle of God creating his own birth into creation and controlling it. A baby that controls his own birthday. Uh, I know we talk about that, like, your baby will come when your baby wants to come, but Jesus really did. He was controlling his birthday. Our, our eternal God has just entered into time. So it's incredible. And that is why the wise men have come to worship Jesus. Uh, because he's worthy of their worship and he's, wor and, and he's worthy of our worship too. This is why we can worship Jesus, because nothing is Nothing is so fantastic, or nothing in fiction is so fantastic, uh, as this story of how God became a man and dwelt among us. But this isn't fiction, right? And that's what makes it more fantastic. This is nonfiction. How God would become a man in order to live for us. And that's why we should worship Jesus too. You know, the unfathomable draws our worship. We worship things that blow our mind. The story of Jesus blows our mind, at least not to. And that's why we should worship him. This is also why the wise men are coming to worship Jesus. Um, so, scene number one kind of opens up with uh, this statement. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east uh, to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Uh, I think James Mont Montgomery, in one of his um, hymns, says it best. He says, Sages, lead your contemplations, brighter visions, beam afar. Seek the great desire of nations. Ye have seen the infant light. Come and worship, come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn king. That's scene number one. Um, as these wise men come in order to worship Jesus from afar. He is the desire of the nations. He is the desire of these wise men who are coming from a different nation. I want to key, key in on King Herod and the wise men and, and then go into the light in order to talk about what they are because there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions and traditions that have offset who these people really are. So first, let's start with who these wise men were. Um, in Greek, it's literally called magi, and uh, it's where we get the word magic, which is kind of interesting. Um, and now, we normally think there were just three of them because of the three gifts that they offer. But Matthew doesn't say if there were only three of them. There were probably many more. There were probably about 12 or so uh, in order to travel with safety. It uh, would have been a dangerous trip, uh, and for survival's sake. I don't know if you've heard uh, names given to these wise men, uh, Malkir, Casper, and Belshazzar. That's tradition. Uh, I think it sounds like characters from Aladdin, uh, but <laughs> the Bible doesn't say, okay? Um, if we were going to gauge this story from a Christmas pageant, uh, then the wise men would arrive in Jerusalem at the same time as the shepherds. Uh, but these are two different accounts. This is about a year or so after uh, that the shepherds witness the birth of Jesus. Um, we know that for multiple reasons, um, such as um, Herod, who, who directly following uh, the wise men uh, and their trek to find Jesus, uh, issuing a decree that demands that two years and down, babies born in the land are exterminated. So we know that Jesus was between one and two uh, at this stage when they actually came in order uh, to, to see him. And as far as what the, the Magi were, um, we, we sometimes call them kings, and we were especially uh, drawn to that title based on the hymn, We Three Kings. And uh, they probably weren't kings, but they were king-like. Um, they probably dabbled in astronomical observation with astrological speculation, um, and they were political characters of some degree. Uh, they were wise men, and that's actually a pretty good 
translation for what they are. Uh, they probably were counselors for the king's court. Uh, they played political and judicial roles in probably Babylon and Persia, which means these men were from a pagan nation. It's not as if they were Jews. It's not as if uh, it's very normal that they would come and seek Jesus. So they're kind of, mis kind of mysterious men. They, they wear many hats. Um, we don't know all of their background, uh, but we know this. Jesus is drawing these men to himself at this point. And it brings great hope for us as we think about uh, those people who we, we want to come and worship Jesus and encounter uh, his incarnation and the, the way that we know him to be God and man. And it brings hope for us too, uh, as maybe we don't come from Christian backgrounds, but we come from something else. God has an ability to draw all, toward, to all, all sorts of people to himself in very rare ways. Now, King Herod uh, was a different kind of king figure. Uh, if the wise men were like good kings, King Herod is, he is the bad king. Uh, he was a half-Jew uh, because he converted to Judaism. Uh, he was an Idumean, whatever that is, and um, came from, descended from Esau. Uh, he was set up by Rome as ruler of the Jews. And so, Herod is an interesting character because he's actually considered by some, and probably definitely himself, as king of the Jews. And that's why we'll see he feels threatened when uh, Jesus is this king of the Jews, is being born in Bethlehem. Now notice the star in verse 2. Uh, the, the wise men say, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. What is this star? Um, well, from what I hear, uh, it, it, it's possible that the wise men believed that major cosmetological phenomena uh, signaled the rise of some kind of deity, some kind of king. That's why um, they're coming to worship Jesus, because they've connected astrology to deity, and specifically to uh, the birth of this king of the Jews. Now, although we typically think that this star has led the wise men to Jerusalem, uh, Matthew doesn't say that either. Notice that they saw the star when it rose, and they knew that it was associated with a king of the Jews being born. They didn't know the name of Jesus. They didn't know anything. They just knew that this star represented a king of the Jews being born. In fact, they call it his star. Um, and so they, they come into Jerusalem in order to get more information. Uh, they, they came into Jerusalem because they didn't know exactly where Jesus was at this point. Now, a little bit later on in verse 9, we'll see the star. The only point that the star leads the, the wise men is from Jerusalem down to uh, Bethlehem, to exactly where Jesus is uh, in, in the house with Mary. Um, we often ask the question, if you're a normal human being, what is this star? You know, what, what was the star? It's quite ominous. Um, so perhaps it was a planet, perhaps it was a supernova, perhaps it was a comet, uh, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps it was something. But the truth is, we don't know, the Bible doesn't say, it was a light, the wise men called it a star. But it may not be any of these things. When you look at it, it's very mysterious because it rises, kind of seems to pop up and then disappear. And then when you look at its movement from Bethlehem, or Jerusalem to Bethlehem, you see that it moves, the wise men follow it, and it, it stops and it rests over Bethlehem. So whatever it was, it was low enough in the atmosphere for it to lead them to this house. I think maybe it was an alien spacecraft. <laughs> this is where, this is where uh, alienists get their conspiracy theories from the Bible. <laughs> no, I don't actually think it was that, but it was something. Um, one man said he thinks it could have been the Shekinah glory of God. It could have just been God's light leading them. Um, like the cloud by day and pillar by night that led the children of Israel uh, in the wilderness. It could have been that. Whatever the case is, I want you to see that the wise men aren't seeking the starlight, but they are seeking what the starlight will illuminate. They say, we have come to worship him, not the light. So what's happening is that they're, they're following the, the, the lesser light of the sky into the greatest light on earth and in the universe. 
The light is leading to the light. As James Montgomery calls Jesus here, he is the infant light. He's the infant light. And, and he's the great one. And I think, uh, as the great hymn, Be Three Kings of Orient R, says in its chorus, O star of wonder, star of night, star of royal beauty, bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. You have this light that leads them and eventually fades out into the perfect light that we see in verse 11. I think Genesis 1, 16 to 18 kind of describes how they seek the greater light. In Genesis 1, 16 to 18, Jesus creates the lights of the sky. It says that he creates a uh, lesser light to rule by night, that would be the moon, and he creates the greater light to rule by day, that would be the sun. And then separates night and day based on the lights. Well, I want to suggest that Jesus as creator is the greater light. Um, and we know that the lesser light is the moon, really only has light because of the sun that reflects through it. Well, Jesus is this greater light, and these wise men <coughs> are following the lesser light to the greater light to Jesus Christ himself. I find that very insightful because it's possible that we, we follow the, the lesser lights in life, like the insights in Scripture, or, or the way that we are enlightened by, new, by newfound facts, even in God's Word. We can be, be very delighted with God's creation, so much so that we're enlightened with facts, but we don't let, let them lead us to worship Jesus, the light. So these wise men don't make the same mistake, uh, neither, neither should we. Uh, now, in verse 2, notice the question that they ask, where is he who is born king of the Jews? And I want you to key, key in on that word, uh, born. He, who, who is he who is, or where is he who is born king of the Jews? Uh, so this, is, this tells us that the Magi knew uh, that Jesus was born king of the Jews because he came from a kingly line. In order to be born a king, you would have to come from a certain genealogy. Um, and, and so by saying that, it, it suggests that perhaps they have scripture in order to back this up. Because the reason that we can be sure, too, that Jesus was born king of the Jews is by looking at the Bible and, and studying family tree, uh, the genealogy of Jesus, which is very important. In fact, Matthew starts that way in chapter 1 in order to give us proof that indeed Jesus was born king of the Jews. So uh, this prophecy of Jesus being born, born king of the Jews would have dated back to Genesis 49, 8 to 10, uh, where Israel gives his sons, uh, his 12 sons, blessings, and that creates the different 12 tribes of Israel. Judah is given uh, the allotment of, of king. So listen to what uh, Genesis 49, 8 to 10 says. It says, Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler, the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. I just want to keep you to key up on verse nine, where Judah is called the lion's cub. I think that's neat. You see Jesus as, as the lion of Judah here, as a cub. He's, he's the cub king. It reminds me of Lion King, um, you know, where this cub is born as king. Um, and everybody comes around, all the animals of the animal kingdom, to worship, and they literally bow down before this new king. That's kind of what you have happening here. You have the kings from afar, the wise men, coming in order to bow down and worship the cub king, the, the lion king. The only difference, um, there are many differences, but Jesus is the perfect, uh, perfect cub king, right? The symbol was <coughs> obviously not. Uh, so, like I said earlier, in order for these wise men to ask this question, where is he who was born king of the Jews, would have required some additional knowledge uh, for them to know that. I don't think they were just getting that from a, uh, from a star. I don't think it was just general revelation, even though, for instance, Psalm 19 says that creation speaks a type of language that brings glory to God. I don't think they could have understood this without some scriptures. They probably even had access into uh, some Jewish people who had migrated from Jerusalem 
Uh, and so you can just see that general revelation never leads to Christ alone. Uh, we need his word and we need his people. Uh, Romans 10 is a classic example of that where it says, um, you know, how can they believe in, in Christ without somebody being sent, without somebody preaching, without the word of God being spoken because faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So I think these, these men did have some scripture uh, that brought them to Jerusalem, uh, but they connected it with the star. Maybe they, they knew that Numbers 24 prophecy. Um, but now let's, let's, let's look at their purpose, which is to come and in, into Jerusalem to, to worship Jesus. They, they spell it out. We have come to worship Him. So what is worship? Um, well, in, in the context of this, let me, let me say that worship means acknowledging and identifying a king in your life, responding to him and seeking him. Um, that's, that's worship. We all have authority figures in our life, and that either symbolically or literally, and that, that, that makes it relevant for all of us to worship something or somebody. Um, remember that God is looking for true worshipers. Jesus says that when he's full grown. In John 4, 23, I, I'm looking for, he said, the Father is looking for worshipers, true worshipers who worship me in spirit and in truth. We see that happening here. As these wise men are coming with the purpose of worshiping Jesus, God has been looking for this. God is looking for that with us too. People who will worship him. That's the point of conversion. God wants people to worship him because he's our authority figure. And these wise men illustrate Worshiping God in spirit and truth marvelously. Um, you know, many people will worship God as a spirit or a symbol, but not in truth. Uh, these, these wise men put the truth to the spirit because, because not only do they come to worship God who is spirit, but they come to worship God who is a man. And I think that defines our worship well when we worship Jesus. True Christianity worships Jesus as God who is spirit and God who is man. So what you see happening is the Magi are coming to worship the majesty. In verses uh, 3 and 8, 3 to 8, we see false worship enter the stage. For everything so true, there's always something false, right? There's always counterfeit. Well, Herod is the counterfeit king side to these wise men. Um, and so it seems like in verse 3, uh, King, King Herod is very interested and intrigued about the wise men, with what the wise men are intrigued about. Verse 3 says, when, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and, and, and all Jerusalem with him. So assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Um, now, the reason that he's troubled and agitated is because he realizes by Jesus being born king of the Jews, his position might go. He's, he feels competition, divine competition, because he's known as king of the Jews, and now he's being told that another king of the Jews has been born. Of course, he's only half-breed, too, so he's not the real deal. So he's, he's threatened by Christ's kingship, and that's what we'll see. He doesn't really worship Jesus, although he says that he wants to uh, in verse... Eight. He says that I too may come and worship him. But it's fake, it's, it's, it's fake, it's fake worship. Um, it's fake worship because, well, I mean, we know he tries to kill um, Jesus. Uh, but I, I want to I hang out on that, that concept that he feels threatened with Jesus Christ's kingship and position because it will dethrone his own. And let me suggest for us, if we're going to worship Jesus, we can't be, we can't be afraid that he dethrones us. And that we're not king of self, but he's king of us. Remember, to worship God means that you make him king of your life and respond to him. And that means he might threaten your position, uh, your status, and, and your, your control in life. And that's why King Herod doesn't want to submit. He can't, he can't worship. Um, consider just some of the, the false ways that, that King Herod is going to illustrate false worship. In verse 4... He researches uh, the Bible. He inquired, it says. 
Um, and he finds the, the best commentar commentators of the day in order to find out where is Jesus. I mean, it'd be very possible to think that he's really seeking to worship Jesus. You know, he's, he's, he's studying scripture. He seeks religious leaders, the chief priests and the scribes. And he offers lip service. I, too, have come that I may worship him. So you see Herod going through the motions of worship. And he's going to reveal uh, two more things about false worship. He wasn't acquainted with the scriptures, and that's why he had to call for uh, the, the chief priests and the scribes. And he also, he also believed, notice he believed in this prophecy about Jesus as king of the Jews so much that it frightened him. And he sent the wise men on a mission to find, find the baby for him in verse 7. So here you have a man who's saying, I, I, I've come to worship Jesus, but it's fake. But listen to how close he is to worshiping Jesus, or how it looks like he could want to worship Jesus. He believes in these scriptures so much so that he's searching for Jesus. He's, he's searching the Bible, he's seeking the best religious leaders of the day, and the best scholars of the day. So let me just say, we too can be apologetically persuaded that, yes, Jesus is the king that was born into the world. I mean, Herod was persuaded about that. But it never sinks into our heart. We can persuaded, be persuaded that the Bible is true with our mind, but not allow Jesus to affect our heart like Herod. You'll notice, too, that Herod doesn't draw near to Jesus. He sends the wise men to do his business. He's not really interested in Jesus. He won't go and find Jesus for himself. We, too, can, can rely on other people for our relationship with God. We can assume that because we have a great religious leader in our life, or because we have great books and authors in our life that we're worshiping Jesus like King Herod. And yet, having a good pastor, a good religious leader, uh, good, good books, doesn't mean that you're worshiping Jesus, especially if you're not putting in the work to come and travel and see him yourself. Well, in verses 7 and 8, in response to the prophecy, you can see how Herod hardens his heart to God's word. So he, he summons these wise men secretly, and he asks them uh, when the star came up. What he's doing is he, he's trying to ascertain how old uh, Jesus is at this point, so that later he can, he can kill him uh, in verse 16. Um, so this assumes that the star rose as soon as Jesus was born. As soon as it rose, and the wise men who were studying the sky very carefully knew when it rose. As soon as it rose, Jesus was born. So that's how we know Jesus was one to two years old, based on asking about the star here, and then later uh, Herod ordering that decree to, to kill one to two year or two year olds and down. 